This is part of a tutorial for students studying in the Ocean and Naval Architectural Engineering Discipline at Memorial University of Newfoundland's Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. Today's tutorial covers the taxonomy of vessels and the decomposition of the realm of vessels into some representative classifications and families of vessels. Furthermore, we're also going to look at the nominal definition and purpose of some of the most common classes of vessels you may work with in your career or just see in a large harbor. The objective of today's lecture is to increase your understanding of the way we, as a profession, subdivide ships into archetypal classes and how we can group ships by their primary underlying functions. A thorough understanding of the types of vessels that are currently in use and their purposes is an essential and often underdeveloped skill for junior naval architects. Early in this course, you'll be asked to think about and propose a vessel design. This raises a whole host of questions. What type of ship do I want to design? What is its mission or purpose? What type of qualities does the vessel need to have to fulfill this mission? Does it need to have any capabilities for submissions? What are the trade-offs required to meet more than one design objective? And how am I going to decide that balance? Finally, and perhaps most importantly, is there a need for the vessel I'm proposing and has someone already solved this problem? If so, what makes my vessel better, worse, or any different or redundant? Most of these questions roll into elements of ship design and planning such as mission statements, concepts of operation, design intent, and statements of requirement. Your course instructor will delve into many of these aspects throughout the course. We'll also get into some of the details as these tutorials go on. Meanwhile, one of the best ways to understand where to go with your design is to recognize some of the salient features of designs that are already in the operational area you're interested in developing a design for. By the end of today's lecture, you should be able to identify the major categories of marine vehicles, define the purpose of a variety of marine vehicles, and list the number of classes of vessel within each category. According to Watson in his seminal book, Practical Ship Design, in the latter half of the 20th century and the early part of the 21st century, we've largely divided marine vehicles into three broad classes, vessels that are hydrostatically supported, vessels that are hydrodynamically supported, and hybrid classes we term advanced marine vehicles. Let's begin our examination by identifying the common order and families of hydrostatic vessels. Hydrostatic vessels comprise monohull and multi-hull vessels. Common monohull designs include sidewall hovercrafts, amphibious hovercraft, submarines, and the most common vessel type, the conventional displacement hull. Multi-hull craft include catamarans, trimarans, and swaths. Hydrodynamically supported vessels include planing hulls and hydrofoils. A hovercraft, also known as an air cushion vehicle, is an amphibious craft capable of traveling over land, water, mud, ice, and other surfaces. Hovercraft use blowers to produce a large volume of air below the hull, or an air cushion that is slightly above atmospheric pressure to produce lift. They are now used throughout the world as specialized transports in disaster relief, coast guard operations, military and survey applications, as well as for sport or passenger service. A surface effect ship, or sidewall hovercraft, is a marine vehicle that has both an air cushion, like a hovercraft, and twin hulls, like a catamaran. When the air cushion is in use, a small portion of the twin hulls remains in the water. When the air cushion is turned off, the full weight of the vessel is supported by the buoyancy of the twin hulls. Currently, SESs are used primarily as small ferries. Now let's consider the most ubiquitous class of ship out there, the displacement hull. As you may have learned in some of your previous courses, a hull is simply the watertight body of a ship or boat. The hull may open at the top, such as a canoe, rowboat, or dinghy, but in ship design, particularly the large ships we're concerned with in this course, the hull may be fully or partially covered with a deck. Atop the deck, there may be a deck house or other superstructure, such as funnel, derrick, or mast. The hull displaces a volume of water equivalent to the weight of the vessel to maintain its equilibrium in the water. Displacement hulls represent the majority of designs that come to mind when most of us hear the word ship. Perhaps one of the vessels most identifiable to you is the submarine. A submarine is a watercraft capable of independent operation underwater. Most large submarines consist of a cylindrical body with hemispherical or conical ends and a vertical structure, usually located amidships, which houses communications and sensing devices as well as periscopes. Submarines rely on a system of ballast tanks filled with air or water to adjust their buoyancy in the water. Submarines have one of the widest ranges of types and capabilities of any vessel. Military uses include attacking enemy surface ships or other submarines, aircraft carrier protection, blockade running, actors in part of a nuclear strike force, reconnaissance, conventional land attacks, and covert insertion of special forces. 
Civilian uses for submarines can include marine science, salvage, exploration, and facility inspection and maintenance. Submarines can also be modified to perform more specialized functions such as search and rescue missions or undersea cable repair, as well as tourism and undersea archaeology. Alright, now let's turn our attention to multi-hulled vessels. Perhaps the most famous and ubiquitous of the multi-hull vessels is the catamaran. A catamaran is a multi-hulled watercraft featuring two parallel hulls of equal size. It is a highly stable craft thanks to its wide beam. Catamarans are often seen in delicate inshore applications thanks to their low hull volume, small displacement, and shallow draft compared to monohull vessels of similar lengths. The two hulls combined also often have a smaller hydrodynamic resistance than comparable monohulls, and a strong resistance to both healing and wave-induced motion, making catamarans popular in use for sailing vessels, passenger ferries, and a number of other specialized uses. A trimaran, or double outrigger, is a multi-hull boat comprising a main hull and two smaller outrigger hulls which are attached to the main hull with lateral beams. Most modern trimarans are sailing yachts designed for recreation or racing. However, they are also in use in applications for ferries, warships, and traditional small fleet fishing boat designs in southeastern Asia. A small waterplane area twin hull, better known by the acronym SWATH, is a twin hull ship design that minimizes the hull cross-section area at the waterline. As you may recall from your studies in ship dynamics, minimizing the ship's volume near the surface area of the sea minimizes the influence of wave energy, maximizing the vessel's stability. A swath vessel possesses most of the displacement necessary to keep the ship afloat beneath the waves where it is less affected by wave action. Also, a quick shout out to the swath for being another cool Canadian engineering creation. Okay, let's take a few minutes to introduce hydrodynamically supported vessels. These types of vessels take advantage of the hydrodynamic lift that is generated perpendicular to the oncoming flow direction as a craft passes over water at a sufficient speed. Let's begin by considering the planing hull. Planing hull forms are configured in such a way that they develop positive dynamic pressure and a decreased draft as their speed increases. The dynamic lift reduces the wetted surface area and therefore also the drag on the vessel. They are sometimes flat-bottomed, sometimes V-bottomed, and more rarely round-bilged. You may have commonly seen planing hulls in certain types of high-speed sailboats or in motor and jet boats. The last type of vehicle I'm going to introduce today is the hydrofoil. A hydrofoil is a lifting surface, or foil, that operates in water. As a hydrofoil craft gains speed, the hydrofoils lift the boat's hull out of the water, decreasing drag and allowing greater speeds. Hydrofoils had their peak in popularity in the late 60s and early 70s when they were subject to high-level experimentation by the Navy. Since then, there has been a steady decline in their use and popularity due to a hydrofoil sensitivity to impacts and large expense compared to similar catamaran. When they are employed, one of the common applications for hydrofoils is high-speed passenger applications. Alright, so to summarize what we've discussed here today, marine vehicles come in an enormous variety of styles and designs for a wide range of applications. However, fundamentally, when we first sight a marine vehicle, we can rapidly assess it as hydrostatically or hydrodynamically supported. From there, the craft can further be classified as a monohull, multi-hull, planing, or hydrofoil design. Finally, monohull designs may be air-cushioned, surface displacement, or submersible in nature, while multi-hull vessels may have equal displacement hulls, displacement outrigger configurations, or small waterplane area hulls. Hydrodynamic designs can be based on foils similar to airplanes, or planing hull design that skim along the surface of the water. Now, before I wrap it up here, a quick cautionary note. This is simply a quick overview of marine vehicles and has been presented in pretty broad strokes. There are all sorts of semantic arguments about other aspects of marine vehicles, such as submarines with multiple hulls, submersibles, ROVs, and offshore structures, as their own categories of advanced marine vehicles, the role of tethered or umbilical structures, etc. What I've presented here today is a classical introduction to some of the typical avenues of ship design, and if you're curious about some of the highly interesting niche categories, you should now have much of the skill and vocabulary necessary to discover those aspects of naval architecture for yourself. In the next tutorial, I'm going to introduce a number of the major platform types and their purposes, and we'll go into some of their unique details. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions or feedback, please leave them in the comments below, and one of our admins will get back to you. If you like what you're learning here, please hit the like and subscribe button so you can stay informed about what's new and applicable to your studies or learning. We're constantly trying to publish new, innovative content that redefines how students and professionals learn and consolidate their engineering and naval architectural knowledge.